Hello and welcome to ESMO 2019. Um, we are here to talk to you today about the holistic needs of non-small cell lung cancer patients with an outcome rearrangement. My name is Rachel Thomas and I'm a lung cancer clinical nurse specialist at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital in London. And this is my colleague. I'm Jackie Fenimore. I'm a lung cancer nurse at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. And we're here with eCancer today. Lovely. So maybe um, just starting off, what would be helpful, Jackie, for me to understand, because um, I know there are differences across country, about your experiences of managing ALK uh, patients in your setting. Are there any particular challenges or things that you've noticed? Well, they're, they're obviously a very small cohort of the lung cancer community, um, and they've got the uh, often uh, because they're out positive, they, uh, they've come from a different type of typical lung cancer background, so they've often never smoked. They've sometimes um, picked up the diagnosis of lung cancer without having any major symptoms or some very unusual symptoms. Often they don't feel breathlessness, they may present with brain metastases. So often um, psychologically they need a lot of support to come to terms with the fact that they've been given a diagnosis of lung cancer. Yeah. Do you find that? I do, and I found also that um, unlike um, other lung cancer patients, they tend to be really young. So it's, I think our, one of our youngest patients was in their 20s, Gosh, and there was a lot of um, distress for her because when she presented, she had widespread metastatic disease. Mm. So there was that fear about having that um, and how we were going to treat that. Uh, and also the, the mortality and facing up to her own mortality when she thought she'd probably live into her 80s mm. and that was no longer going to be the case for her. So there was a lot of, in the beginning when I first met her mm. and we were talking about starting treatment, it was almost like treatment was important but this was really important to try and address yeah, that side of how things. How she would cope with things. Yeah, how yeah. did you find that she managed on the treatment? Did she have any particular um, issues she, with coping? She, she had a bit of a rash, um, but we managed to deal with that with her. Um, I think she was less concerned um, about that than stopping treatment. I think she was more con worried that if the rash was particularly bad, we'd have to stop treatment and then what did that mean for her and would we restart it would uh, you know a lot of patients when you stop treatment uh, panic at that disease is going to rapidly progress because yeah. um, rash is quite a common side effect of these ALK uh, positive yeah. drugs but uh, we can normally manage those quite well in the clinic but I think for a young patient in her 20s obviously that's a very visible problem for her because uh, she'd have to explain to people why her skin mm. has changed so mm. it's, it can be less of a trivial problem for a young woman, can't it? Yes, yes. Um, what we tend to do in clinic is stop the treatment for a time and treat the rash with creams and sometimes um, antibiotics if they've got some infection in the skin and then restart the treatment and that seems to be managed quite well. Most people can cope with that and the rash doesn't always come back as severe when we've had a break in treatment. Do you do the same? Or we do do the same, yes, we do. And I, picking up on a point that you mentioned earlier about this being a small cohort of patients, yeah. what other support do you offer your patients so that they don't feel alone in having this cancer diagnosis? Okay. Well, we, we always have, make sure that the patients meet a clinical nurse specialist in the clinic and we have a contact number that they can contact. We find that the patients on these treatments don't tend to have too many problems with side effects, but we always give them the information that they may develop diarrhea, they may feel some nausea, occasionally vomit. The rash can be a huge problem, but we're also checking their bloods regularly to make sure that they're not getting liver toxicity um, and things like that. But most patients, it seems to be the psychological impact that we really need to support them absolutely, with. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, the, one of the things that we've done in our centre, because we've, we realised that this group of patients was unique and had a different set of care needs to 
maybe a 70 year old smoker mm -hmm. um, might have we set up a patient support group and one of the things that the patients that attend that group they're very proactive so they do attend a support group yeah. is that they are able to share experiences yeah. with each other and also they're now talking about um, having lobbies and uh, pressure groups for okay. government to be able to ask for more research and investment into their particular type of cancer. And is that is that a support group for the UK or is it more local to um, your hospital? It's, we would accept patients from anywhere, but it's mainly London area, um, which means that patients would have to travel. Yeah. But also, um, I was really interested that at BTOG this year, there was a patient advocacy group for ALK positive patients and they have set up quite a good social media presence yeah. and we're now encouraging our patients to, we've obviously we've met the person that runs that group and we've looked at who regulates that information on that group but we're now trying to encourage our patients to yeah. join that group and, and access that group. They have, yeah. um, I think recently they had a day in Birmingham where they invited two expert doctors wow. to come and present. Um, and it was great to see a room yeah. full of uh, ALK and um, EGFR patients all together. Okay. So these networking. patients tend to be supporting each other through yes, these yes. groups. I know I've heard yeah. about Alk UK, yeah. and that's they've got a Facebook page, haven't yeah. they? And I did meet some of the advocates at BTOG yeah. as well, and it was really interesting to sort of see what they're up to and how they're supporting each other. Yeah. And they're, they're looking for new treatments because mm. obviously, even though life expectancy with patients with an out positive mutation have it, it increased there's still cases where patients don't do so well and mm. then they're looking at other trials and yes. other areas where they can maybe get some yeah. effective treatment. So and I think these groups are great for supporting. They are, people. they are. And just picking up on that point, do you find, because I find in my practice, that when patients don't get as long as they feel that they should be getting on these drugs, mm. um, so for instance, one of our patients got seven months and then she progressed, and she was really upset because she was expecting the she'd heard patients being on the drug for a year or more and she she was really put out that she hadn't had that and then she had to go on to chemotherapy yeah. do you find that that causes patients in your setting um yeah. psychological distress and anxiety about having to go on chemotherapy I, th I think people are looking on the internet especially our younger cohort of patients and they obviously want to do better than the average and then if they're doing worse than the average uh, that that really does affect them quite uh, more than you would be able to anticipate because people obviously are very hopeful that we've got these new treatments for uh, lung cancer but individually we can never really predict who's going to mm -hmm. respond well to treatment and when people do badly I think it's so difficult for um, us as healthcare professionals to know what advice to give because people are looking for a cure, aren't they? And, and, yeah. and it's still stage four disease. So even if we're able to push the boundaries, we're still having to deal with the fact that this is a, a terminal illness at some point and that people's lifestyle will be impacted by yeah. that. And I think if, if I was in brand new CNS, lung cancer CNS going into um, looking after this group of patients, particularly from somebody of your expertise and experience, what would you say would be uh, the top things for me to remember from to looking after these patients? Um, I think the, the main thing is, is a diagnosis of lung cancer is always extremely difficult for people and, and that we have to be um, able to guide them as much as we can with that. But uh, we need to listen to the patient and what's important for the patient because it's often things that we can help with, but it's often that we can signpost them to the, the relevant support or information that they need. So I think that's what, you know, you just really have to listen to what your patients are saying, don't you? Yeah. And do you find um, having maybe regular telephone contact with your patients during that first sort of month on treatment is, it can be really helpful to yeah. them to alleviate fit and also to pick up early side effects as well. We found that. Yeah, I think some people really, really respond to mm. having um, a telephone call, either that the, the nurse makes to them or that they can ring in when it suits them mm. to to just catch up and, and go over things again because sometimes 
when they're given information in clinic, they just can't take it all in, and there's a huge amount that they're dealing with psychologically or just trying to remember what we what we're saying, and then sometimes they just need to revisit that again. Yeah, and it's useful if they can bring a family member with them yes. because obviously two pairs of ears is better than one. Yes. And I think we need to support the family members yes, as well. Yes, I was just going to say that's absolutely right. That's a really important point that sometimes the carers get missed out and, it, you know, some of our carers are more anxious than the patients. Um, and so it's how do we support them as yeah. well in, yeah. in what's going on for their loved one. Yeah, and I think open communication and trying to get everybody to be as open, as honest as they can, even if that's distressing, it, it paves dividends in the long run because you can actually get their concerns out in the open and you can be more open and honest as a healthcare professional. Yeah. So we hope you found that session very uh, informative and I hope that you've managed to take away some um, top tips from our shared experience with you and thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye. Thank <music> you.